Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another edition of Ridge Talk. Uh, as you can see, there's just two of us here today, uh, Justin and Sean, Pastor Hello. Daniel and Luch. Uh, they're both out today for, for different reasons. Uh, as always, feel free to uh, like or subscribe the episode uh, at the information there down below so that you can uh, continue to receive new episodes when they are released. Yeah, we got a few questions that we're gonna answer today, which is also a reminder um, as you are liking and subscribing and doing all of those things to also uh, submit questions to us. That is one of the reasons that we started doing this was to provide another platform for people to either ask follow-up questions for sermons or maybe some other lingering questions they may have that we don't have the opportunity to address um, from the stage during a service. So. Yeah, and we've been, um, just to give you some clarity, we've been going a little bit back and forth. Um, we started talking a little bit about counterformation yeah. and the things that are forming you. Um, as well as answering questions on the current series we have in the uh, New Testament letter to the Colossians. Yep. Um, and today's episode is going to focus specifically on some questions we've received uh, regarding Colossians. And uh, the first question that we received, actually, uh, the question came from an earlier podcast uh, on Colossians. Uh, one of us, and I don't know who it was, said something just about um, some of the mystery that is involved in the Christian faith. And there certainly is some mystery uh, within the Christian faith. Uh, but the question really came down to, uh, hey, there are some out there who have um, just an absolute certainty about some theological point that they have. And uh, because of their certainty, it's, uh, it's almost like joining a club where you yeah. are, uh, you know, looking down upon others, uh, you know, seeing others as lesser than because they don't, they haven't come to the same understanding. And the question was, you know, hey, is that does that go against uh, the Great Commission when when you've got all these different uh, clubs out there? With, yeah. with different viewpoints. And is it like counterproductive to the overall mission of trying to reach people when uh, you approach them with such absolute certainty that you kind of get, um, I think the way that they said it is that it's, it can become like a club that is wielded against people who don't see things the same way that that particular person might. And what we're kind of really talking about is, um, and you'll get into this further explanation, but uh, things that are uh, theological points that Orthodox Christians throughout history may have different viewpoints yeah. on, especially those types of things where it's like, hey, this isn't falling outside of um, what we would consider Orthodox Christianity, but it's it's questions that um, there are longstanding, uh, maybe well-supported perspectives on things and the importance of how we handle that. Yeah, so um, just a really simple example in that. I think I shared this in a message. Uh, it's been a few years now though. Um, but uh, you know, the, the little country church that I grew up in um, believed in infant baptism. You know, a, a family had a newborn baby and, and the baby was uh, baptized within a few weeks of being born. And uh, I just remember attending this, this small little country church. Uh, the pastor would explain, hey, we're gonna baptize this child. This is why we do this. Here's what the scriptures say. And, you know, I'm a kid in elementary school, right? I'm, I'm third grade, fourth grade. Um, this, is, this is all unfolding. And I'm just kind of taking the pastor's word for it. This, this is what we believe. This, you know, they're explaining it from the Bible. Uh, and then later in life, um, just through a, a, a variety of circumstances, I was attending a different church and uh, the pastor said, hey, when we do baptism here, we believe that the person needs to be of age to make a decision to follow Jesus. So we don't do uh, infant baptism. We only do baptism once, once a person reaches a, enough of an age to make that decision for themselves. And this is why, and this is what the Bible teaches. And and it just kind of struck me like, oh, here's two different churches with two different perspectives on this topic of baptism. Uh, now I've kind of got to go through and, and really wrestle with the scriptures mm -hmm. to find out what do, what do I believe in this? So um, it's an excellent question because I think that 
um, you know, the person who wrote the question said, does this, does this go against mission? Does this go against the great commission? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, my simple yes or no answer to that is yes. Yeah. Uh, that it is counterproductive to the great commission. And, um, the way we have always illustrated that here at Southridge Church is just to uh, just to kind of imagine that um, the importance of different beliefs, um, you know, the the importance of the theological beliefs. Uh, what's most important? Let's put the most important ones in jar one. Okay, well, what are the most important ones? Uh, well, when you really whittle it all down, the most important ones are what is essential. For salvation, mm-hmm. that's you know that's that's where the most important one is, and uh, this is where um, you know the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, several different evangelical churches, Protestant. You know, you get Methodist, Baptist, um, Presbyterian, Lutheran. Um, there's consensus on that. Like, yeah. hey, this is what is essential for salvation, and uh, okay, that's great. We have consensus. Um, but then you can move on to things in jar two. Like, hey, what are some other important theological teachings in the scripture? Um, and one would be that topic of baptism. Uh, baptism is important. Uh, we see it and, and we believe that that's an important aspect of the faith. Um, uh, communion would be another yeah. example of that. Uh, you know, it's not essential for salvation, but it is important. Uh, so those would be in the jar two category, but not you know not everybody might agree with how to go about those things, mm-hmm. but they would agree yes the scriptures teach this and it's important. Uh, then when you get into jar three, that's when you get into some of those disagreements among denominations mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, and you know how do you do baptism? Is it infant? Is it uh, you know only when you reach a certain age? How do you do? Communion. Yeah. Um, you know, do you have the same view as the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or Evangel? You know, how, how do you go about doing that? And that's where you have uh, several of those different beliefs: uh, Methodist, Baptist. Um, you know, there's just going to be a variety of views that are down there. Uh, and you know, it, it would be my hope that you know what Jesus prayed in the garden with his disciples you know he prayed i pray that they be one mm-hmm. as as you and i are one um i don't i don't think that you know we as followers of Jesus ought to use the belief that we have the conviction that we have as a club to beat others over the head with yeah absolutely <laughs> not um yeah, i go ahead. Uh, I can draw on a little bit of life experience with that too. I was privileged for six years as a pastor um, to be part of a ministerial association Mm -hmm. that was made up of pastors from multiple denominations and and non-denominational churches that would 100% have disagreements in some of those outer issues on things. Um, And they were so great at never letting that stand in the way of joining together in the common purpose of serving our community together. And uh, that would be the hope that we would not get so caught up um, in some of those differences that don't affect um, orthodoxy, that we would allow that to get in the way of accomplishing the mission of Jesus together. Um, Whether that's in a small group, whether that's in a congregation, my hope would be that it would be even within different churches within a community, that we wouldn't segment ourselves off and, and sort of not work together uh, yeah. as a result of some of those differences. Yeah, I, I mean, I think of that, you know, in the Christian faith, this is just the question that people wrestle with all the time is, uh, hey, where's that line that we can't cross that line? Mm-hmm. And um, this is, you know, this is just me speaking my perspective here. I think, I think too many people draw that line in a place that it doesn't need to be drawn. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, hey, we, we, had, you know, we have to speak the truth, but we're going to forget about the grace part. Yeah. Uh, and they draw that line too soon. And really it just comes down to that jar one, like what's essential for salvation. So, yeah. you know, if I had a relative who was, uh, again, this is just me. And, you know, other people might have a different perspective on this and that's okay. If I had a relative who invited me to the baptism of their infant, 
would I attend the service? I think I would. You sure. Know? Like I would, I would attend the service uh, as a gesture of love toward them and being a participant in, in that moment with them. Would I have a different perspective on baptism? Yes. Would I need to tell them how wrong I thought they were? <laughs> no. Um, it's going to be an interesting uh, dinner afterwards if you get into that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> um, I think I have a good segue actually here because what came to mind as you were describing that is um, when we think about the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I would say that that is such a good litmus test for uh, how we would work through any of those differences and how we would express that. If we are uh, not able to be kind and gentle and patient in our differences, then uh, we should understand that maybe those differences are becoming something that they really shouldn't be. If they're not, if we're not able to operate in the, the fruit of the spirit while navigating some of those things, and that's probably an indication that something's off and that it is becoming counterproductive to our mission. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, do you feel like we've satisfied that? I think so. I just, um, you know, Brennan Manning's book, um, the Ragamuffin Gospel, it's one that I read every couple of years. Just uh, it focuses so much on the grace of God. And he's got a quote in there of, uh, hey, anytime you're, you're using the scriptures as a weapon, mm-hmm. um, then you're not using the scriptures correctly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I just, I just try to remember that. You know, if, if somebody's using their theological certainty on anything other than just the essentials of salvation, mm-hmm. And, and looking down on others, uh, or being judgmental towards others who don't have the same viewpoint, um, I think they've missed the the uh, underlying crucial aspect of the scriptures. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, I, I brought up spiritual fruit because it kind of plays into the next question that we got, um, which is about bearing fruit. And the question came in um, kind of on behalf of a small group that is meeting mm. here in the church. And so uh, the the person that kind of came to us in representing their small group said a few weeks ago, we were discussing Colossians 1.16 and the idea of being fruitful. And uh, they went on to say, we also discussed the topic of bearing fruit that we see in John chapter 15 and the reality that we're not able to bear fruit unless we're attached to the vine. And that's a metaphor that we use. Um, Jesus said, you know, uh, I'm the vine, you are the branches, yep. basically saying that if we aren't uh, closely attached to or abiding in Jesus, that we won't bear um, <laughs> the fruit uh, that is a result of the spirit at work in our lives. Yep, that's uh, John chapter 15. Yeah, and so um, they were looking at where we were in Colossians and then apparently they um, also delved into the idea of bearing fruit elsewhere in scripture in John 15. And then they said, lastly, we referenced um, Matthew chapter seven in verses 15 through 20. And it's when Jesus was um, laying out uh, how you could recognize false teachers based on the type of fruit that they were bearing. Again, mm-hmm. this is a metaphor that's used all throughout scripture. What, what do we mean by bearing fruit? We mean the, the work of the spirit of God in your life toward Christ likeness. It's what we're talking about when we're talking about the counterformation and formation things. It's, it's do... Uh, are we in process of becoming more Christ-like? And what are the things in our life that would identify that? We use that metaphor of fruitfulness. And so here's kind of the question. They were, they were looking at these multiple areas in scripture that talk about bearing fruit, um, trying to understand uh, when we're examining the world around us and examining different people, whether they be believers or non-believers, how do you start to um, really gauge based on fruit? And it says, it does seem easier to determine if a believer isn't attached to the vine by inspecting their fruit, whether or not it be our fruit or other people's fruit. When we are disconnected from Jesus, it is usually evident by the fruit that we bear or don't bear. And so our question 
comes about a non-believer or false teacher? Why does it seem that often it looks as though they are bearing fruit? They are loving and kind and generous. They're faithful. They serve other people. They're encouraging and supportive. Mm. And this applies even to atheist people who would reject Christianity outright. Um, We all have non-believing friends like this who often exemplify good fruit and character and who look who often look more fruitful than even some believers. Um, so how do we sort that out? Shouldn't it be easier to recognize um, what, what fruit is coming from uh, what source? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, I feel like you can go a lot of different directions in trying to answer that, especially in like 10 or 15 minutes uh, here. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, I have just some initial thoughts on that, I guess. Again, we're not going to probably satisfy every Every facet of this, right? But the the way that I would begin to think about that is, um, first of all, I I do identify with and um, can understand that idea of, hey, oftentimes when I'm looking at people who claim to be following Jesus and who are following Jesus. And I see some of the things in their life and some of the things in their character. Um, it, sometimes it doesn't seem all that Christ-like. And then I'll encounter a friend or somebody else who is not following Jesus at all. And they're the kindest, gentlest, most generous people I've met. And mm-hmm. I can go, man, it sure seems like this person who doesn't follow Jesus is more Christ-like at times than this other person or this other group of people over here who is following Jesus. And so if I'm trying to base it on that outward fruit, how do I assess that? And it's confusing to sort of like figure out where that's coming from. And the way that I would start to begin um, processing through that is to, is to say, I think that... Um, There is grace that is extended to all people. We use the term common grace, that we live in a world where it is possible for people to love and to experience love. We live in a world because God created the world that um, we're able to be kind, we're able to be generous and to serve one another. Um, And that does not necessarily uh, come from us being connected deeply with Jesus. It's just kind of, it's a possibility in the world because of the grace that God has extended to the world. And so I would look at it and I would go, okay, the fruit that we're looking for, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, that list that I gave, Mm -hmm. um, the source of that we would recognize is the work of the Holy Spirit within us as Jesus followers, as people who um, have been saved by Jesus and are being saved or are being sanctified through becoming more like him. Um, the source of that is a deep connection to Jesus through the spirit. And then I would say, what is it pointing toward and what is it building? True spiritual fruit Yes, it, it, it makes us a kind person. It makes us a loving person. But that ultimately shouldn't point to me as a kinder, loving person. It should point people to Jesus and his character. It should point to Christ likeness. And then what does that look like in the world or what is it building? It should be building Jesus' kingdom here on this earth. And so I think people can be kind for many reasons and many ends. And one of those ends is that it makes them appear to be a better person. They can be loving. They can be all of those things. They can be motivated by, by caring for other people. But if it's not ultimately pointing people back to Jesus and it's not ultimately working to build his kingdom on the earth, I think that's where I would start to look at some of the delineation there. Yeah, yeah. If it's rooted in, I really just want other people to like me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's different than I want people to get to see Jesus within me. Yeah, and I and I'll, I'll take it a step further. I think that um, I think even people that aren't connected to Jesus are capable of uh, expressing like sacrificial love or or love that is that has their own self interest removed from it. Yeah, um, you know. But again, it is that pointing to Jesus. And is that working to establish his kingdom or is it 
just a means to an end in and of itself. Yeah. We wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Yeah, love people, love people selflessly. Um, but as Christ followers, it's connected to Jesus to point to Jesus to build his kingdom on the earth. Yeah, and I think that you know the question is such a complex one because you get into the topic of fruit and okay, well, what's spiritual fruit? What's not spiritual fruit? What's, you know, we, we can read the fruit of the spirit, um, but then getting into what, you know, what does each of these terms mean? Mm -hmm. um, specifically in Christianity, not just in our culture. And it does broaden the question so much. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is just uh, in my own life. Um, you know, I've got family or friends who are not believers who do come across very loving, very kind, and, um, you know, one possibility is um, they have thrown off the burden of legalism and, in, in, you know, in, in their humanity, they feel free. Um, they feel like, hey, I don't need to try to um, please God or please yeah. other people. I'm just, you know, I, I don't feel burdened by that. And uh, because they're living such a non-legalistic life, they do come across very loving and very kind uh, towards others. And I think that's just, um, you know, that's a, that's a struggle for Christians. You know, we don't want to see ourselves as legalistic, but yeah. sometimes we are very legalistic um, about things. And uh, in the, you know, as a result of that, uh, we lose our own ability to love well. Yeah, I think that um, what I'm, if I'm interpreting you properly, it's kind of the idea that I think the disconnect that this person identified or this group identified that, hey, why is it sometimes when we look at Christians that we actually don't see uh, the things that we see in these other people? Yeah. And I think one of the things can be if people who are following Jesus are trying to be loving or kind or truthful or whatever, out of a motivation of earning God's love or favor or recognition, then that's where it gets distorted. And that's where the disconnect between uh, being consistent happens. It's, it's where uh, hypocrisy comes from because the motivation is wrong. It's twisted. It's not coming from a place of being fully accepted by God. It's not coming from a place of being um, so attached to Jesus and being and being so um, working from that whole identity in Him, yeah. it's actually coming from this other thing, and that's how it gets distorted and becomes something it was never meant to be. And and that's wh why this is so complex. And we're also dealing with a metaphor, right? When we're talking about like, how do I identify this fruit or that fruit? I think some of the other trickiness is we're dealing with a metaphor that is is behavior based, but not behavior based yeah. and like all that. And it just gets tricky. And I would say that ultimately, you know, while it is impossible to not look at the world around us and see how other people are conducting themselves. And as we're in community with other believers, um, it's not possible for us to be completely unaware of the ways that people might be being inconsistent or the fruit that may, they may be bearing or not bearing. But I think a point that you made this last week um, is, a, is a valid point that ultimately when we start to go down that road of examining the conduct or the fruit of others around us, mm -hmm. that can become a whole lot easier thing to get sucked into and to, and to fixate on, whether it's positive fruit or negative fruit. And what I've tried to do in my own life is to not hide from that, not to pretend that that doesn't exist, not put my head in the sand, but ultimately to come back to myself and go, okay, that, you know, this group of Christ followers may not be uh, bearing the type of fruit uh, that I think a follower of Jesus should bear. But what about me? Yeah. Am I bearing the type of, where are the places in my life that I'm not bearing? Uh, healthy fruit or that I need to allow God to prune something away so that I can be more fruitful. Yeah. I think ultimately coming back to a place where we start to internalize some of that stuff and, and go, I don't want to spend a lot of time and energy trying to think about how other people need to fix their fruit. 
I should use that as a thing to remind myself, hey, I need to look at myself now and and examine the fruit that I'm bearing or not. Yeah, bearing. I think it I think it comes in with the uh, the first question that we talked through. Um, uh, when you've got such a theological certainty in an area that you're looking down on others who don't have that same certainty, mm-hmm. um, then you're going to be bearing less fruit yeah. in that moment. Um, the example that you just shared there, this is, um, I'm not sure when we're putting this episode out. Uh, I just did the message on Sunday on the second half of uh, Colossians chapter two, but I just shared an illustration that when I, first got involved with the um, emotionally healthy discipleship material, um, I became very good at identifying emotional dishealth in the lives of others yep. uh, in, <laughs> instead of in my own life. And, uh, you know, if you go back, you know, if, I, if I went back in my own life and just evaluated, when are the seasons in my life that others may have said, Justin wasn't being very fruitful. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure Justin's a Christian or, you know, Justin's yeah. not producing a whole lot of fruit. If, if, if you look back on, on those seasons in my life, um, a lot of people wouldn't have any idea what was going on behind the scenes in my life. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that, uh, you know, looking back now, I would agree with them and their assessment that I wasn't very fruitful in that season. Um, but I also know what God was doing deep beneath the surface in my life, the things that he was pruning away from me in order for me to be able to be fruitful again. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, that's something that, um, you know, Sean and I were talking earlier. There's, um, you kind of have to be careful how you say this because, you know, salvation is salvation. You don't want to say that, um, you know, you're a level one Christian, you're a level two Christian, you're level, you know, it doesn't work that way. Um, but I would say that there are different stages that we go through in our growth. Being somebody who focuses on spiritual formation, discipleship, there is a growing process. And, um, there's actually good data now Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, uh, you know, somebody comes to know Jesus and, and they go through the first two or three or three and a half stages And then they come up on this thing, you know, we can call it the wall or we can call it the dark night of the soul or we can call it whatever it is. And uh, the research now for evangelical churches uh, in the West is that about 90% of maybe more of evangelicals come up against that wall and don't get past it. Mm -hmm. Don't, Don't go through it. Um, and you know what? They are believers. They're going to be in heaven. They're, they're you mm-hmm. know, recognizing their gifts and the talents. They're serving. Um, but the, the full ability to be fruitful, especially in the area of love, doesn't really fully come out because they come up against that wall and, uh, and aren't able to go past it. Yeah, yeah. The, the wall being the point at which fruitfulness has hit a cap yeah. and in order for more, and it's, so it's not even saying there's no fruit. Right. Right. Being born. Yeah. There's it's, totally fruit. They, it's, it's hit a cap and in order for there to be more fruitfulness or ultimately more Christ likeness. Yeah. There's a, there's a deep there pruning. Some things happen. Yeah. A perfect and, example. Like um, we have these beautiful rose bushes that grow in the back of our house. I love them every year. I have um, some rose they bushes, but they're not beautiful. Yeah. And, <laughs> and last year, um, my wife, at the end of the previous season, uh, she knows when to do it. I don't remember when this was, you know, cut the one way down. Yeah. Um, and, it, but it, it was, it had beautiful flowers on it that year. Yeah. Like, and, and I kind of was like, skeptical of like, well, that bush was pretty. Like you just cut it almost all the way down to the ground. Like, you know, I, I trust that. I think you know what you're doing, but in my mind, I'm trying to make sense of like, that thing looked great this year. And now like it is down to a nub. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And, and it took a bit. And even like when the other bush started blooming, it was kind of lagging behind. And then, uh, you know, I could have very easily been like, well, what's wrong with that thing? Like it was, it was fine. Like you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have touched it. You shouldn't have, 
trim those things off. It was pretty. Now it's nothing. Now it's it looks dormant and dead. Yeah. And then a few months later, it Exploded. bloomed spectacularly. Yeah. And so what I would say is it is so important, especially when it comes to people and we're looking around and we're trying to identify the fruitfulness in their life. And maybe we look at one person and it seems like, man, they, they've got some beautiful things happening there. And we look over here and we're like, man, they kind of look half dead. Like, I don't know that they're going to make it. My point is we don't know that they're not in that season yeah. of some things have, have had to get trimmed off and they're about to flourish in a way that is just going to uh, be incredibly beautiful. And yeah. so I think the, that- The people that seem least fruitful in Jesus's day are the ones that he spent the most time with. Yeah. And, and so we uh, need to try to give people the benefit of that doubt yeah. and to pray, pray for each other regularly and to encourage each other regularly. I'm I'm definitely sympathetic to the to the tension that we feel with. Well, why is this person who rejects Jesus outright? Thanks for looking at me. Like while a, you're yeah, I'm pointing at you too. <laughs> why is this person um, a whole lot nicer, nicer to be around? Yeah. Why like why why do they seem a whole lot more Christ like than people who are following Jesus? And again, I would say um, it's, you know, how we identify that fruitfulness, like, you know, that rose bush that we had, it was producing flowers. It was fine. It just wasn't to the potential that it could be. And that's what I would say, even about, you know, people who don't know Jesus, it's not, we're not saying like, oh, everything about them is horrible. There's nothing good that comes out of humanity, but it's just saying that uh, the potential for what a person can be when they're connected deeply to Jesus is what we're after. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I um, I think that's all of the questions that we did receive this week. Yeah. Um, there is great stuff uh, all throughout Colossians. There's there's actually somebody here at the church who told me, uh, I don't know if they told you or not, um, that they took a seminary class on Colossians. Hmm. And uh, throughout the entire semester, they only got through chapter two. Like wow. in a semester of seminary, they didn't even get through the whole letter and it's only four chapters long. So if so, you've thought that our current series is too long, yeah, don't go to seminary. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a lot of great stuff in Colossians. We do hope that you're digging in and, uh, and, and getting that. But um, you know, more importantly than that, like I, I am an advocate for reading the scriptures, right? Like yeah. I, I do believe that. Um, but uh, I also am a firm believer that uh, information doesn't always change our lives. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we can gather information even from the scriptures and from some great authors that are out there. Um, but if we don't allow that information to really get down deep into our heart and our soul and our spirit and transform us, um, then, then, you know, we're just wasting our time. It's not really doing anything. So yep. our prayer for you would be that you're not just engaging with Colossians, but that you're allowing the word of God uh, to transform you uh, as it can, uh, that you will spend time in the presence of God, experiencing his presence in every area of your life. Um, you know, as John 15 says, abiding in him in all things. And uh, yeah, I think that's all we have for today yep. with the questions that we got. But uh, once again, feel free to uh, like or subscribe down there on the bottom. And if you do have additional questions you want to send us, uh, feel free to do that. And uh, since Sean mentioned a small group earlier, um, hey, if there's anybody watching this who has any interest in the possibility of being a small group leader sometime in the future, uh, reach out and let me know because... Uh, you know, through the spring and summer, I can make sure that you get the training and the resourcing and the equipping that you would need to do that uh, sometime soon. And we're always looking for new group leaders. So yeah, feel free to let me know. Awesome. And we'll catch up with you guys again uh, in the next episode. See you.